Well, I think years ago, what I started to do, you know, just like in 12 steps where they have you do an inventory and things, I think that's those are all really helpful steps. What for me it was, I started to just honestly look at my actions and my motivations and my things I was valuing in this world. And I saw that it was just all of the things that I was working so hard at were all based on fear of consequences. You know, if like if somebody just kind of came and waved a magic wand and said, you know, if if you didn't have to do any of that, if you could just be joyful and peaceful and blissful, and there was no consequences to kind of anything, then what is it that would really light your heart up? Uh, you know, sometimes even in uh, career counseling, they use that approach. What color is your parachute? You know, they what what really is I is where your heart is. You know, what what would you really give yourself over to if you could do anything? And so when I started to realize that m most of my life was based on fear of consequences, I just had this moment where I thought, this is no way to live at all. This is li this is this isn't living. This is fear. I'm just acting and reacting out of fear. And uh, and then, you know, then when the world bombards you know, with all these thoughts of, you know, better do this, watch out for that, be careful of this, you're not safe. I mean, if you, if you looked at the thought behind a lot of advertising, it's you're not safe, the world's not a safe place, it's gonna get you, it's gonna get you, be careful, watch out, be careful. I just thought, this isn't worth it, you know, I. I it's not worth another day. It's not even worth another moment to live that way. So then you start to turn inside to that core motivation, like, okay, just suppose I could live my life out of out of love. What if I could live my life out of out of trusting instead of fearing? And and not take another step. In other words, if if fear comes in as the motivator to go, whoa, whoa, whoa here, wait a minute. I'm not just going to do a knee-jerk reaction and go out and spend some money or buy something or take action to try to, uh, to hold off that fear or try to dissipate that fear. But what, how can I live from, from inspiration? And that's why I was saying at the beginning that this, the Course in Miracles is really calling us to be miracle workers. You know, that's just something most of us didn't consider. Uh, most of our parents were not saying, okay, little Jimmy, when you grow up, you're going to be a miracle worker, you know. You know, how many of us were encouraged to be miracle workers? No, we end up having to, at some point in our life, go, ah, oh, that feels good. I don't know fully what that is but I'm willing to move in the direction of that because it has a resonance. It is something to really share and extend. So, you know, to me that's the thing. It's, there's no kind of formula to it, but there, there definitely was a sense of um, I wanted to give, I wanted to share, I wanted to extend. When I started having these mystical experiences, they were so vast and expansive just like 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 my whole consciousness was just e expanding in ways and I was seeing new vistas and visions and things. And then I thought, well, what would be the most joyful thing but to extend that? And in, in very much of an involuntary basis, like, you know, showing up to have heart-to-heart -heart talks and gatherings and not having them pre-planned, not knowing who was going to show up, what would be presented, whatever, just going out there and just winging it and letting the joy kind of spill out through me. And I thought, this is great. Then people would say, well, yeah, it may be great and you're having a lot of fun at it, but you can't make a living at it. And it's like, I don't know. Why would I as assume that, you know? Why wouldn't I assume that that if, uh, if it's my greatest joy to shine and share that, that everything I would seem to need to do that would be provided. You know, I could go with that thought. That seems a lot more loving and uh, positive. Yeah, to okay, let's test it out. Let's give it a test. And then when I tested it, 
you know, in the early years, like back in the 1980s, you know, I was going out, no apartment, no condo, no house, not paying rent, just winging it. It's almost like, yeah, well, Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. It should be just as equally applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago. And, and it was always oh, so much more fun than, than even having a career and staying in hotels and, you know, having ironed sheets and all kinds of things, you know, to be in people's homes and, and get to t share with them like family, like everyone's family. It was like much more fun than the hotel, you know, circuit and everything. And I thought, oh, this is much more fun. And so it became fun. It became gleeful, joyful. And then everything that I seemed to need was provided, almost like it was a skit. And the Spirit's like, okay, you're going to need some props for your skit, so I'll give you some props. But don't ever be concerned or invested in the props, because that's not really what the play is about. You know, the props are not the storyline. The props are not the message. The props are used to convey the message, but the props don't have any meaning in and of themselves. I found that uh, very much enjoyable, too. I was sharing, like, with with Sky, Sky let go of her her dogs, and then now she's on the road and here's dogs, dogs, dogs. She stay with David. There's dogs. She comes here. There's dogs, you know, and that you can do that with anything. Even if you had children, you hit the road, children, children, children. You know what did Khalil Gibran say? Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Whew, that's kind of cool. It, you know, it, it's like you can still have the joy of the dogs, of the children of, of things, and yet you have the essence that's underneath it, and you don't have the, the weight and the worry and the concern of the possession. As soon as we feel like we can possess it, then the question arises, do you have the possessions or do the possessions have you? You know, that's the real question, <laughs> you know. So it's like it becomes a way of life. It starts off as a practice, but then it becomes a way of life. It becomes as natural as breathing, you know, where at first it seems to be like a conscious effort. You know, just like when somebody's freeing themselves from an addiction, it seems like they have to put a little bit of effort to free themselves from that addiction until they're free. And then they're like, oh, yeah, this is great. Now this is the way life should be. It's like if you, it's like you were, you were swimming or something. You know, initially, you know, you, it takes some time to develop the strokes and takes energy and effort. But then... After a while, you know, it just gets to be a rhythm and a flow, and you just it starts to feel much more easy and natural. And the toughest part is, is when we're turning away from an old belief system that really has never served us. You know, it's just, it seems like the ego goes kicking and screaming a bit. Like, what are you doing? I, I made you. I own you. I am your master. You are the slave. And you're like, no, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, not going to feed you anymore. Not going to give you my mind's energy, you know. And then it just gets easier and easier and easier. Uh, I, d I like that part where Jesus says miracles are involuntary and they should not be under conscious control. It's when we start to try to direct and control anything, really, that we, we get out of our natural nature of just pure beingness. And we start to try to, you know, force something or make something fit. That's where the difficulty comes in.